with us today, whether you're in person or online, we are just glad that we're here today getting to worship God. I uh, am Phyllis uh, Barron, I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm just glad to be here with you today. Now look at the end of your pew and you'll see those black notebooks. Will you please take that and sign your attendance and then pass them down to someone. And if someone comes in a couple of minutes late, make sure that you pass them to them and just make a new friend today when you do that. Know that all our hymns and responses will be up on our screens, whether here in person or on your phone or your tablets at home. Also, there are some bulletins in the back if you prefer that. Now, today in Wesley Hall, if you haven't made it over there yet, go after worship. And it's, there's tables set up that says, find your place. It talks about all the different ministries of the church so you can find ways to connect. And also today, I wanted to do a special lifting up of the adult Sunday school classes that we have and also all the grace groups. And I hope that you will check those out and find your place there. Also, on October the 16th at 11 o'clock, we have Healthy Plate Breakfast. And a Healthy Plate is where we learn about the discipleship program that this church has adopted. So I hope that you will join us there. And then Pastries for the Pastors is October 23rd at 9.30 in room 350. These are, uh, this is designed for people that are looking to see if they want to make this your church home or if they want to join the church. So I invite you all to come to that and just learn a a little bit more about our church. Now we have the pleasure of listening to our Fifth Street Bells as they have our prelude for us. Thank you. 
Good morning. My name is Thane Arthur, and I welcome you to worship today. After the call to worship, we will remain standing and sing Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, number 64 in your hymnal. And now, if you will, please stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship. All heaven and earth proclaim the majesty of God's creative power. Praise oh, God, God for the amazing and awesome beauty. God has given to us codes by which to live together in harmony and peace. In these commandments, God has summed up the ways we protect one another. Rejoice in the goodness of God. Praise God for God's complete and steadfast love for us. Amen. be seated. Amen. Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm the senior pastor here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. We're going to be reading our scripture a little bit differently today. We're going to have a responsive reading of the text. And for a very important reason, our scripture reading today is quite possibly the most famous portion of all of the Bible. Biblical scholars call it the Decalogue. In our common parlance, we typically call it the Ten Commandments. If you've been to Hobby Lobby, you have seen this scripture before. <laughs> Pretty much everyone's familiar with it in some capacity. However, this scripture is meant to be responded to. It's meant to be encountered in context of conversation. I'm going to talk about that more in our sermon 
later on in the service. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to lead you in a responsive reading. The Decalogue is found in Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 2. And I'm going to read each portion, and then you're going to have a response. So our tech team is going to have the words up on screen. I'm going to do my best to speak slowly so I don't run out ahead of you guys. But then we're all going to have a responsive portion after each one of the commandments together. Hear these words. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, holy triune God. There is no one like you. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. O Lord our God, with thanksgiving, we delight in the very good purposes for which you have created all things, including us. We are humbled to be signposts of your glory. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Heavenly Father, we honor you with our words and vow to keep your name holy and sacred. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Thank you, God for making holy the rhythm of rest and recreation, both in your work of creating and restoring all things and in your rest, you desire that we would be with you. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. God, how gracious you are that you do not leave us on our own. Thank you for the privilege of seeing your faithfulness extend from generation to generation. You shall not murder. Thank you for the gift of life and for creating each person as an expression of your love and faithfulness to the rest of your creation. You shall not commit adultery. Thank you for the beauty and security of marriage the intimacy of lifelong companionship, and the power of covenant promises. You shall not steal. Thank you that you are our provider and for creating us in a community where we can delight in extending your resources to each other. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Thank you that you do not show favoritism. In Jesus Christ, you extend your hospitality even to us who have been enemies of your kingdom. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female slave, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. God, thank you for the freedom to celebrate your care for others and for us. You are more generous than we have yet to imagine. Free our hearts from earthly desires and set our eyes on heaven. All this we pray for the glory of the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the full unity of God's people, and the flourishing of God's kingdom. Amen. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite any children to come down to our spot for our time together. And any kids watching at home, hi, you can join us too. We're going to play a game, play along. Kids, come up.
Okay, so we just did a long litany that involved the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to see how well we were all paying attention. We're going to play a game, and the game is called, Is It One of the Ten Commandments? And anytime you hear something that you think is one of the Ten Commandments, I want you to go ding, 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 ding. Let's all practice together. <clears throat> and if you hear something that you're pretty sure that Mr. Mark just snuck in there and is not one of the Ten Commandments, I want you to go, eh. Yeah, very good. All right, here we go. <clears throat> I am God, the only God. Have no other gods but me. Amen. Yep, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Um, here's another one. Do not make me turn this car around. Yeah. yeah. Are you sure? That should be. All right. <clears throat> Do not make or worship idols. Ding, 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 ding. <clears throat> take all you want, but eat all you take. Yeah. God's name is special. Do not misuse it. <laughs> Take a day of rest, a Sabbath each week. Make it special day for God. <laughs> yep, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Never polka with a porcupine. <laughs> nope, you shouldn't do it. Honor your parents. <laughs> An apple a day keeps the doctor away. <laughs> do not kill. <laughs> No, yeah. we shouldn't kill, which is what you're asking. Yeah, I, I, I know where you were headed with that one. I hope I know where you were headed with that one. All right, um, if you get married, be loyal to your spouse. Ding, 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 ding. When you burp, say excuse me. <laughs> Good rule, but not one of the Ten Commandments. Do not steal. Do not tell lies about others. Do not forget the television remote belongs to Mr. Mark. I think it's a very good one. And one more, don't wish for things that belong to others. Ding, 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 ding. Very good. You know, I almost put, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. But that really is what the Ten Commandments are. That's wonderful. And like so many great passages of Scripture, the Ten Commandments or the 23rd Psalm or when Jesus uh, tells people about who their neighbors are, but first says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your body, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and your neighbors, yourself. The Ten Commandments are about loving God and loving others. They're really important rules that help us get the most out of life. Give your brains a kiss. Give your hearts a hug. You did a very good job on the Bible quiz. If you'd like to go upstairs, come join me right there at the door. If you want to come join us upstairs, come join me right at that door. And before we sing, I have a quick music announcement. So the music ministry is in the process of starting a chamber orchestra to play with us during the service. I know that everyone loves to hear uh, instruments play along with the organ and with the choir. And who wouldn't want it to have it a lot more often? So you can play a part of that. So if you play a brass instrument, a string instrument, percussion, handbells, <laughs> You are needed. There's a sign up in Wesley Hall, or you can email me, uh, should be here on the screen, T. Williams at FUMC, my FUMC, or just flag me down. We would love to have you share your gifts uh, each week or whenever you can in worship. Let us now stand together. We sing our hymn 381, I think. Yes, Savior like a shepherd, lead us. <laughs>
Amen. Hello, everyone. Welcome and good morning again. Before we consider today's scripture reading and today's message, I want to thank all of the people who are part of worship here every Sunday morning, our technology team for connecting us both here on Fifth Street and anywhere in the world worshiping online. So glad that you are with us this morning, whether you're live or catching up later on. I'm glad you're here. I want to thank all the folks who are in discipleship ministries with children, youth, and adults every Sunday. A special word of thanks to our music ministry. So thankful for you all, especially our handbell choir for blessing us today. I don't know about y'all, but there's just something after the last few years and so much of life is experienced through strings, just something about being in a sacred place, listening to real sacred music with real people, moving, moving real air. It just means so much to me and to my heart. So it's a blessing I will never, ever, ever take for granted again. Friends, I'm, I'm thankful that you're with us. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm the senior pastor here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. And I shared with the 930 service that one of the things that's true when they're training you to be a pastor is they're training you to serve in churches that are like the majority of churches in the United States. And, and by that, I typically mean smaller churches. The average church in the United States before the pandemic had 100 people in worship on a Sunday, and now it's even less. And like many of you, I have uh, been a part of churches like that, blessed in churches like that. The, God is doing amazing things in churches just like those. And when you're being trained to be a pastor, that's typically the, the way they're training you, is to go serve in a congregation along those lines. And First United Methodist Church is a larger church than that and has more going on and can be a little bit more complicated and exciting. And uh, there's, there's lots of things happening in a church like ours. And sometimes you have to look for inspiration outside of simply uh, church leadership materials on how to best be prepared to be in a church like this. I'll never forget when we were going through the process of uh, the planning, the building planning for the Baker Family Children's Wing, the new expansion that was just finished, uh, at one point I was in a meeting with you know, professional folks and there were architects and there were schematics out and we were looking at the east parking lot and there were some uh, sewer lines that were coming from pre-World War II era buildings that were going through areas of the parking lot and they had to figure out and work with the city, are there easements or not utility easements, et cetera, et cetera. How does that influence the, the project? And I remember just sitting there around the table going, this was not in Bible school. They did not, they did not teach, prepare us for this in Bible school. And so I'm so thankful to be in a church with expertise of so many people who can guide on projects like that. And so you got to look outside just church leadership when you're in large churches like this. That counts for lay leaders too. Members of the church are primary leaders in our congregation. And the church has many things in common with businesses. It has budgets, it, it has plans, it has strategy. But of course, the church isn't a business. The church is like a nonprofit in that its ultimate purpose is to change the world, to make a difference in the world around us. And it's focused on making sure that that's done in, co in partnership with stakeholders and volunteers and people who are generous and support the purposes of the organization. But the church isn't a nonprofit. A church is like a school in that part of its core mission is bringing people inside the facility and, and helping them learn and be shaped and understand so that they might be transformed and changed. It's like a school in that way, but it's, it's not a school. So in reading all these different materials, sometimes you can get some really helpful things that help you not only lead in a church, but better understand what church work is. And one of those things that's influenced me a lot over the course of the last decade is language that's common in the world of businesses and nonprofits and schools. And that's the language of organizations taking time to really outline what are our missions, our visions, and our values. What's our mission? Why are we here? Why are we doing what we do? What's our vision? What does succeeding in our mission actually look like? And what are the values to which we will adhere that are going to guide the way that we live and work together and with the world while we're pursuing our mission and in light of our vision? What's our mission, our vision, and our values? I think about that a lot. I, I, I was uh, doing some research on it this week. I came across one that it, it just seems like a a company that produces goods, but they had a bigger mission. Their mission was to accelerate the world's adoption of sustainable energy. So yeah, they're making products and things, but that was their mission. So everything they do has to fall in line with that. There was another uh, organization. It's an athletics apparel company, but they had a bigger mission than just selling shoes. It was to inspire every athlete. That was their mission. And they said, if you have a body, then you're an athlete. And I looked at myself and I went, not exactly true, but I appreciate what you guys 
we're trying to do. The church has a mission. The United Methodist Church explains it to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's the official mission of the United Methodist denomination, and individual churches might express it in different ways. One of the ways we communicate here at First Church is love God, serve people, transform lives, but ultimately that's just make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Other churches use different language about it. That's its mission. But do you realize that God has a mission? God has a mission with God's creation. God has a vision of what God's mission succeeding will look like. And God actually communicates values to be lived into that will guide the mission and success in the vision. Do you realize that? That's the lens that I want us to use as we're exploring today's scripture. And this is the conclusion of a sermon series. We're in a sermon series right now called The Power of the Promise. And promise is our modern-day language for a very important theological word, word that means, or called covenant. Covenant. And covenant is a word that's used over and over again in Scripture. And what it means is a promise, and it means a commitment, and it means something that you stick to and with. And one of the things that you need to understand is that God is a promise-making and promise-keeping God. That's key to understanding who God is, and it's key to understanding how we live in relationship with God. God is a promise-making, promise-keeping God. The course of this series, we've been looking at some key foundational stories, these beginning stories of God and God's people, stories that come to us from Genesis and Exodus, and we're looking at them through the lens of promises that God makes and lives into and invites us to live into in return. The story of the covenant that God makes with Noah and all of creation, that God isn't capricious, that the world won't be destroyed wantonly, that we can trust in God. The story of God's covenant promises with Abram, understanding that it's through faith and following God that we will experience transformation and ultimately salvation. We looked at all of these different stories and the understanding that God is a promise-making and promise-keeping God, and our responsibility, responding in faith, is to live into those promises, to step into those same covenants. I've invited you over the course of this sermon series to join me in praying daily the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer. It's a, a prayer that has a strong historic significance in the Methodist movement. It's been around for hundreds of years. And we've kept the Wesleyan Covenant prayer active in our communities of faith for hundreds of years, not just because it's old and traditional, but because it works. Our churches around the world have prayed this prayer over and over and over again. We as a church have been praying it every day for a month, asking that these words will continue to do their work in us, that through God's grace we can respond to the covenant into which God invites us that we can ready our hearts to say, God, whatever you have next for us, whatever you would do with us, whatever is next in the future of our hearts, our family, our community of faith, our church, to God, all of that, yes, and more. That's why we've been praying that prayer. I invite you to make praying that prayer a regular part of your daily devotions and reflections. And that's what leads us to this moment of hearing this text. It's important to understand that God is Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's because God is Trinity, a loving community, that creation exists in the first place because it's the nature of loving community to grow and to expand. God breathes creation into existence, not to control it or to condemn it, but so that it might respond to God's invitation of loving relationship. That's why we're created free, because nothing can love you if you force it into it. Love can only be Uh, truly experienced if it's free to be accepted or to be rejected. That's why God made all of creation and each and every one of us free. As God's creation continued to grow, it began to come up with stories, began to ask, who are we and why are we here? Humanity invented stories about gods that were made in humanity's own image, and they were violent and capricious and fickle. So God pulled pulled apart a portion of humanity, formed a covenant community, began to reveal who God really is. No, no, no. Creation isn't the byproduct of murder or incest or the things that are in all of these stories that you're telling. It's like this. In the beginning, God begins to reveal and to shape and tell God's story to God's people because God is on a mission. Because God has a mission. 
The mission is the salvation and the restoration and the redemption of everybody everywhere to loving in relationship with God. That's God's mission. That's God's purpose. And the vision that God has is a covenant community pulled aside into which God can teach and reveal and promise and show up and provide. And the people who are a part of this aren't going to figure it out immediately. But over generation and generation, decade upon decade, century upon century, they will come to understand God's faithfulness. And it's into that community that God can become incarnate, join us, come alongside us in the power and the presence of Jesus Christ, not just for deem and, uh, redeem and forgive one community of people, but all people everywhere. That's God's mission. That's God's vision. And God has values that are going to be a part of shaping that community. So it's easy to read so many portions of Scripture and to just hear them as lists of rules. In fact, it's so easy for people to come with an understanding of faith that faith is nothing, nothing more than a list of rules that you need to follow, otherwise you're going to get in trouble. How many people think that that's all that faith is? A list of rules that you need to follow, otherwise you're going to get in trouble. I was teaching a small group at one point, and uh, a woman raised her hand, and she says, for decades— that's exactly how I felt faith has been communicated to me. And she said, I'll never forget, it began with my youth group. And the one thing I remember hearing over and over and over again at my youth group is don't smoke, don't chew, and don't hang out with boys who do. <laughs> and that was it. There was no grace, there was no gospel, there was no love. Don't smoke, don't chew, don't hang out with boys who do. That's it. See you next Sunday. Faith is just a list of rules, and if you break them, you're in trouble. That's how it had been communicated to her. But is that the real purpose of rules in the first place? We have rules in my family. For those of you who know our family, I have four children between the ages of four and ten, and we've got some rules. We've got some rules that, frankly, my kids think are unfair and impossible to follow. Rules like no screaming, and rules like no hitting. And rules like no lying, and no stealing, and no hurting. Said positively, there are rules like treat each other with respect. Don't hurt, keep your hands to yourself. Tell the truth. There are rules like that. Are my wife and I making rules like that in the hopes that our kids will break them so that we can punish them? No. We have rules because we're trying to shape a family. Our rules are all about trying to form a family that loves each other, that treats each other with respect and kindness, that doesn't harm each other or hurt each other, that loves each other, and that treats each other with honor and respect. Someday. <laughs> but that's the purposes of those rules. Not to come up with a whole bunch of things so that if you mess them up or break them, we can punish you or exclude you or push you out or remove blessings from you. It's to shape you to teach you, to form you in a way of life that is better than the alternative. That's why we have this. This portion of Scripture that we read today, that we see in signs posted all throughout our society, it looks like a whole list of rules. But the purpose of the Ten Commandments is not to come up with a bunch of stuff that we can't do. It's to shape us into a community of people. A community of people that's capable of understanding and living into the values of God. The people of Israel have lived in slavery in Egypt for hundreds of years. They've just been brought out of that oppression. In the midst of it, God makes a display of God's power that says, whatever you think the rest of the world might have to destroy you, I promise you I am yet greater. You can trust me. And the first thing that God does is bring them to Mount Sinai. And God begins to reveal who God is to them. And says, if you're going to be my people, this is the kind of people you need to be. And that's the purposes of these rules, of these guidelines, of these values. The mission of God is the salvation of all of humanity. And the vision of God is a community of faith into which the Son of God can become incarnate. And the values that guide that community of people are outlined here. The first four commandments are all about your relationship with God. 
as an individual and as a whole community. Not having other gods before God, not confusing yourself into thinking that you can find what you're looking for in love worshiping over here and in peace and security by worshiping over here and in prosperity by worshiping over here. It's one God. By not making idols that make God seem so small that you can wrap your hands around God or fully and perfectly understand God, by not misusing God's name for your purposes and to follow the rhythm of life that God has provided you, understanding that God's greatest vision for you is not productivity, but rather faithfulness and connection. The remainder of the covenants are all about how to live amongst one another in right relationship with each other, community of respect and of valuing and honoring each other, not just because that's who they are, but because of who God is. If you follow these commandments, if you live into these values, then you're the kind of community that can begin to understand who God really is. And I don't want to shock you guys. uh, I'm not a rabbi. (laughs) In case you're confused. I'm not a rabbi. I'm a Christian pastor. I'm a Christian pastor, so I can only read this text in light of knowing what comes next and knowing that the culmination of that covenant community is the incarnation, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ Jesus into a community of people that has spent thousands of years struggling to know and to understand who God really is. So that when Christ comes and proclaims faithfulness in God and the faithfulness of God and trust and hope and salvation in and through him and him alone and the promises made real in his death and his resurrection— because I know what happens next. I see in those commandments the commandment that Christ gave us. When someone asked, what's this really all about? What's the most important commandment? What do we really do? Love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Those commandments perfectly summarized. So what do you do with this? Right? I mean, what do you do with this to take this from being, oh, that was an interesting historical perspective on the Ten Commandments. Thank you. Uh, Let's go get brunch. How do you take this and make it into something that can actually change your life tomorrow morning and the next day and the next day? And that's this. God is on a mission to save everyone, to restore everyone, to redeem everyone, and that includes you. And God has a vision of all of humanity restored and redeemed through Christ Jesus. And God has values, a way that you can know you are a part of that journey by loving God with all your heart and all your mind and all of your strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. And God has promised that salvation is available to you just through faith in that. And what you can do is say yes. And open your heart and say, God, not only do I have faith, but whatever you have next for me, whatever you have uh, planned for me, whatever purposes you have for me or for my family or for our church, to all of that and more, God, yes. And so now, for the final time in this sermon series, I want to invite you by joining me, if you have the piece of paper with you, by following along on the screen, or if you have it memorized, by saying together, for one final time, the Wesleyan Covenant prayer. As we pray, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. Lord God, we give you thanks for your mighty works in Christ Jesus, for your acts of forming a covenant community through faith in you and right relationship with each other, and for inviting us to participate in life eternal through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. 
It's in his name we trust, and that together we all pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In my 10 years of ministry here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth, I have countless times expressed such thanks and gratitude for the members of our congregation in generations past who thought with a long-term vision in mind, the people who were a part of our congregation that had a perfectly, perfectly sized building at 7th and Taylor in the 1920s, but yet knew that God was going to do more through our church and needed to make sure we had a sanctuary that worked not only for that moment, but for the next 100 years for the members of our church who made sure that we always had enough space for parking as cars became more and more important, knowing that we could always fit the people who needed to come to our church. I'm very, very thankful for people over 50 years ago who formed a foundation, a foundation that would help support the ministries of this church for generations to come. And it's in that spirit that I want to invite forward Hank Pop, who serves as the president of the First Methodist Church Foundation. Thank you. Good morning, First Methodist. My name is Hank Pop, and I am the president of the First Methodist Church Foundation this year. I've had the privilege of serving on that foundation board for some 20 years, and this is my third year as president, and I will retire from that capacity at the end of December. Ann and I, my wife and I, Ann, joined First Methodist in 1982. She's much more visible than I because she sings in the choir occasionally. You may have no idea who I am. But Ann and I taught uh, children's uh, Sunday school for 10 years. I've served on nearly every committee of the church. Uh, I've been the president of the church council and the board of stewards. But my real legacy began in 1929 when my great aunt, who was recently widowed, uh, joined back to her Methodist church here at First Methodist. She walked over from the old church in the 30s and in the 50s, she gave the garden that rests between here and Wesley Hall. That is my legacy. My question is, what is your legacy? My question is, what is the foundation's legacy? The foundation was formed on September 30th, 1964. It was formed with, uh, in fact, just 10 days ago, we celebrated our 58th anniversary of the existence of the foundation. It was formed with a magnificent gift of $2,500. <laughs> John Brelsford, who was the business manager of the church at that time, and our senior pastor, Gaston Foote, uh, put together uh, a dynamic group of people to form the foundation. And the current value of the foundation investments as of this last Friday was $75 million. That number is down quite a bit from what it was at the end of December, as I'm sure a little bit of your monies are as well. But we have confidence in our economy, and we have confidence in the leadership of our church. The historical support from the foundation continues on an annual basis. This year, the foundation will contribute some $25, 2500000 million to the budget of the church. And in the next 90 campaign, we gave one of the lead gifts for $1.5 million, which was exactly what was requested by the uh, committee for uh, building the next 90 campaign. During uh, the past 58 years, some $67 million has been contributed from the foundation to the church. We did a little math on that. It's approximately $3,000 a day. The men that formed the foundation in 1964, their legacy lives on today. And you can see it in the names of many of the buildings here in, at First Methodist. Leonard, as in Leonard Chapel. Uh, 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 Armstrong. Armstrong Building, thank you, Lance. Uh, the, uh, also the uh, recent uh, Baker Family Building, 
uh, was uh, funded by Lou Martin with the lead gift uh, there. But I make this joke all the time. A bunch of old guys formed the foundation, but women really made the foundation. Four women gave $9 million through their estates. Their names are Broderick, Stewart, Smith, and Ballard. They were organized by Helen Watts. Helen inspired these women to make these gifts to this church, and that $9 million is the seed money for what we have today. Currently, our board, which consists of 12 active members, five of them are women, and our new president next year will be a lady as well. But most of all, I want to thank all of you this morning. I want to thank you, our congregation, our membership, for what all you do for the foundation. I want to give a shout out to Sid Johnston, who's back here at back. He's been our executive director for the last 20 years and has led and inspired our board. And most recently, I want to thank the one and only Lance Marshall, who's embraced the foundation. It's really been great to have him on board with us, and we're very much appreciative of that. And I want to symbolize that relationship by standing shoulder to shoulder with Lance today. He's going to stand on his toes, and I'm going to stoop down a little bit. <laughs> Lance, thank you very much. Thank you, Hank. I appreciate it. Round of applause, would you please? I want to thank Hank, the men and women who serve on the foundation board today, the men and women who have stewarded its resources for 58 years now. The things that the foundation uh, support allows to do are not only the regular maintenance and maintaining of the seven city blocks that our campus consists of here downtown, particularly as you can imagine, uh, things that are involved in a historic building, like the restoration of our ceiling that took place during the pandemic, uh, upgrades to the bell towers, but also things that are make us uh, relevant and impactful for ministry on a daily basis. Things like the upgrades to HD cameras and streaming or Wi-Fi throughout the campus. All of that is supported by those foundation gifts. And I want to invite you to consider being a part of the long-term financial support of the church through giving gifts to the foundation that can support the church into perpetuity. And I'm so thankful that those gifts allow our everyday regular giving to go 100% to the operating budget, the ministries of the church. In just a moment, Mike is going to lead us in our offering and know that the dollars that you put in the plate go 100% to ministries with adults and children, music ministries, service ministries, all of those things are made possible that your dollars can go directly to those gifts because of support from the foundation. Mike. That's right. The operating budget comes from all of you and from your generosity. I'm Mike Marshall, one of the pastors here. I want to invite our ushers to come forward. And as they do, uh, in gratitude for your gifts today and in all the days to come, we've been lifting up our music ministries today from the things that Thomas said earlier to everything that you've experienced. I'm so grateful for the diversity of our music ministries from our pipe organ and people like Peggy who can play it and for Thomas and and you can just see from from our bell choir to choral union to you may not have known that across the street our youth choir rehearsed earlier and then Mr. Mark ran over here. Our children's choirs have been rehearsing this morning. We have had bands in the gathering in the 1111 service and it's all because of you and I simply say thank you, and now let us offer a prayer. Loving God, we never give alone, we always give with others. So we do so now with expectation, with generosity, and knowing that you will bless all these gifts far beyond our imagination. These things we offer with a smile, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.
I hope you've noticed that through the month of October, the focus in our church is helping everyone find your place. And often that's been happening in Wesley Hall on Sunday mornings. And so if you haven't had a chance to go to Wesley Hall and connect with groups, we invite you to do that. We want everyone to have a worship plus one. Our goal for you is to be able to have something that you connect with beyond worship that feeds you and you have a chance to make a difference. And so there's information in Wesley Hall. For those of you who are new among us, we celebrate you here. And in Wesley Hall, we have an area called on-ramp. All you have to do is go to the back of the sanctuary, just go outside for a moment, into Wesley Hall, you'll see the sign for on-ramp. There are volunteers, there are people who would love to meet you, to offer you a gift, and to discover ways that you can find a place of connection here. And before you leave today, if you came wanting to have a prayer with someone, over here to my right, you see Marsha Ammons, who's standing next to the Congregational Ministry sign. Marsha is here specifically to pray with you, if you would go and, and have a word with her after the service, so that you can leave with that kind of peace we all want. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go, and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.